that long. But I'd like to be sensitive to um, everybody's time, so everybody, those who have to get back to work uh, can do so. Um, so it's my pleasure this afternoon to introduce Professor James Boffman. He is the Fetzer Bis Bascom, Bascom Professor of the School of Journalism. says Bascom Robbins. <laughs> School of Journalism and Mass Communications here at the UW. He holds an affiliate appointment in the university's Department of History and is the chair of the advisory board for the university's Center for the History of Print and Digital Culture. Um, he's a member of the Wisconsin Journalism Faculty since 1979, and I know wow. some of us may have um, partake of some of his classes. His courses uh, include history of mass communications, literary journalism, interpretive news writing, and he's a very popular instructor. You'll be able to see why this afternoon. He received the Chancellor's Distinguished Teaching Award in 2003, and he's also been part of, he head the department from 2003 to 2009 for two terms. So he's an Ohio native, but he doesn't like the Brewers so well. So he, st <laughs> he still keeps his, his affiliation. Um, he had a BA in history at Harvard in 74, and he earned a master's in, and master's in philosophy and PhD in history at Columbia. Yeah, so um, he specializes in history of American journalism and broadcasting, and he's the author of four books. And today he's going to be talking about his latest work, The History of Journalism and Presidential Politics Since 1960s. Professor. Thank you very much. Um, I've got to start with a plug. I can get away with this for this week, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, some of you may know, uh, may remember Bob Taylor, who taught in our department for many years. The school is sponsoring the Robert uh, Taylor Lecture this afternoon at 4 in 2195. Vilas, it is free. Our lecturer is Fred Haberman, who runs a very interesting sort of public interest, public, public relations agency in the Twin Cities. And I just met Fred a little bit ago, and uh, in fact, he's going to be up in the U Club at 1 if you want to crash and just talk to him. <laughs> but please, if you have a chance later this afternoon, come in, and it'll be at 4 o'clock, uh, 4 to 5.30 or so, and you're all more than welcome. How many of you, by the way, did graduate from UW-Madison by show of hands? How many of you have degrees or took courses in journalism? Okay, very good, very good. Anybody work with Scott Cutler? Okay. Scott was a friend, and I got to know Scott and his son George, and many of his students. Uh, uh, he started PR instruction at Wisconsin, I believe in 1947. Uh, when I was director, I got into a rather spirited argument with somebody who said we shouldn't teach PR. And I was a little dumbstruck by that, and, and, I, and the, the, the problem was a critic, who I believe had a Northwestern connection, uh, thought that journalism and PR should be separate. There should perhaps be, be a concrete wall or something like that separating the two. I mean, you know the refrain. And on many levels, I thought this was nonsense. Partly because, as a longtime member of the faculty, by the way, and being introduced, what was, what was not mentioned by Terry is that I was 10 when I joined the faculty here. But, um, thanks. Um, what, 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 what a lot of critics don't understand is that a lot of our students who train to be journalists uh, end up going into public relations. And that there's no shame in that. It's been going on for, it's been going on for over 100 years. Also, as I pointed out rather acerbically to this critic, uh, we are a state university. We can't affect the Northwestern's air of superiority. We also have a better basketball team. Um, as a state university, if our students want to study public relations, we should let them. And so forth. So, in any case, I, my topic today, as Terry mentioned, is a book I've been working on about politics and the and the press since 1960. It's very much a work in progress, and I would welcome your thoughts. If we don't have, if, if you have to run, but would like to comment, my email is my last name, Boffman at wisk.edu, and I'd be happy to get together with you later, chat about some of this. Uh, you won't be surprised, assuming I ever get the darn book out. Uh, that, uh, uh, that the, the coverage has changed a lot since 1960. In 1960, it was much more stenographic. It was much more about what the candidates said. 
most journalists tended to give the candidate the benefit of the doubt. That was a professional expectation. Uh, my book is about how and why that point of view changed over time to something more cynical, less deferential. What the candidate said became why the candidate was saying what he said. In many ways, this was a good thing. Who wants to be a stenographer? But I do wonder if the voter has at times been shortchanged. For example, uh, to what extent did journalists examine the positions of George W. Bush in 2000? How closely were they examined? Uh, or, uh, or Barack Obama, 2008. I want to be an equal, equal opportunity offender here. Um, <laughs> tendency to favor narratives rather than detail. A large part of my story is the intense cynicism of the national news media since 1960. I think it, was, it has been allowed to lapse on occasion, briefly when Bill Clinton was running, and then uh, when, when Senator Obama was a candidate uh, in 2008. I think the cynicism had many explanations. I'm looking at the audience, and several of us can think of two of them, Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon, uh, as explanations. But here I would pull my historian's union card. I don't believe, and this, I'm going to get some argument here. I don't believe American politicians today are any worse than the ones who served us 60 or 70 years ago. There's a lot of Harry Truman love among some people. I don't think Harry Truman was a better president than Bill Clinton. Or a better, he was a more moral man, but I mean, and he's that standard where he, it's another lecture, you know. But, but you know, I don't, I, I think, you know, we, we, we can think of members of Congress and, and governors that might annoy us, uh, but I invite you to go back and look at who was serving in Congress 70 years ago and their competence. Now and, and so, I don't think, as a, as a whole, the political class is the problem. I don't think the quality of those in public life has declined. I think the scrutiny they get has increased. Okay, um, and uh, and and so the other the other thing that's going on is though is that I think there's a consensus among national journalists that elections had ceased to be to be about something as trivial as issues, but instead concerned images. Who could stage the best rally at the state capitol, which Governor Dewey famously referred to as a courthouse? Uh, or who could perform best or not make some egregious error in a televised debate? If that became a focal point. The emphasis on images involves public relations, specifically the increasing attention given to PR practitioners in political campaigns. Here I want to acknowledge what I mean by PR practitioners. They were in some cases individuals who worked in ad agencies. In, in some cases, uh, uh, Roger Ailes uh, had been in television production. Such figures came to be known as political consultants, sometimes full-time, sometimes part-time. Uh, as a group, I think journalists were giving more, probably too much more space to the construction of the candidate's image and to those image builders as opposed to his positions. But let me put some cards on the table. First, I think an emphasis on image is a lazy option. Uh, journalists as a group don't have a very nuanced view of political behavior. Uh, their operating assumption is that a good ad or TV performance can be decisive, affecting voter behavior, or the behavior of enough voters to change the outcome. This is what we call in, in journalism the powerful effects model. Okay? Second, sec emphasizing the mechanics of a campaign spares the journalists of having to analyze issues. This has several advantages. First, issue coverage is boring, you know, thought to be boring to a lot of consumers of news, okay? Secondly, if a political writer starts analyzing a candidate's position, he or she risks giving away her position, revealing her own bias. This is a point that Nick Lemon, a uh, longtime dean of the Columbia Journalism School, made, and I thought it was a very good one, that if you avoid issue coverage, then you don't have to give away your hand, because again, this is coinciding with the time when journalism, as most all of you know, became more analytical. And a reporter's voice did emerge in stories, okay? Uh, uh, so uh, uh, the other thing is that issues have become much more complicated in the last 60 years, meaning it's tough to write about them without making for dull reading. The mechanics of the campaign, the images of a candidate, and his handler cultivates uh, are much more engaging. Journalists and their editors did not always realize this or care. The older model of reporting, which some of you learned or were trained in, 
that is after World War II, tended to be stenographic, what the candidates said. And I've gone back and looked at that reporting, by the way. Some of you think I'm dwelling on mem memory of the good old days, uh, uh, and this will be the last interpretive dance I, I do. I <laughs> but uh, uh, my students do like my Richard III, but I'll spare you that, too. But, but the, the older model was one that some of you learned in courses like 203 and 205 in the J School, was when you went to do a speech story, you cover what the candidate said. And that was what you reported, okay? But what I, I saw in the, begin to see looking at press accounts in the 60s is a displacement. And I, I've got a couple of culprits here, a couple of individuals who I think we can, we can see why this change uh, might have had a, a journalistic origin. The first was a book in, published uh, by Teddy White called The Making of the President, 1960. How many of you remember Teddy White? Okay. Uh, he was, in his day, he was extremely prominent. Uh, it, what he wrote was, the, was, it was the first time one had an instant history of a campaign. It was, by the way, a hard book to sell. White had three publishers turn him down. One asked him why he wanted to write a textbook. He was, he was a journalist. Not a political scientist. And this is the other thing. White had to self-finance the project with an advance he had received for the film rights to a novel he had written. Okay? Uh, and by the way, this is how much of a pioneer Teddy White was. When he traveled on Kennedy's plane, it was, by the way, Kennedy's plane. It was when his dad bought it for the campaign. He was one of two reporters on the plane when Kennedy was first running, which I think is a very worthy. I mean, Michelle Bachman in, in, in 2011 was had won the Iowa caucuses and her plane was full of reporters. I had a better chance of winning the Republican National Convention, uh, not being nominated than Michelle Bachman, and my name was pronounced differently. But uh, thank you. But but here's the deal: White was was onto something. His book, The Making of the President, 1960, was a bestseller for a year, earning him the Pulitzer Prize and a half million dollars. And that's when a half million dollars was a half million dollars, okay? Uh, now, the, the other thing, when you go back and look at White's book, you notice how respectful he is towards both of the candidates. He plainly likes Kennedy more. He's closer to Kennedy. But, uh, but he clearly is, is, be, is being, trying to be fair. But part of the consequence of White's book, part of the strength was he was allowed to go inside both campaigns and show you the day-to-day, -day, what was going on. To give you a, a view uh, of, of the, 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 the traditional journalists did not provide. Uh, so you had an interior of the campaign, strategy and tactics. Then eight years later came another book, which I also think had a profound effect on how journalists and lay consumers uh, uh, consumed political journalism. It was by the late Joe McGinnis, and it's called The Selling of the President, 1968. Again, it's a book some of you will remember. Either you read it or you had a brother or sister had a copy. Like White, McGinnis described the inside of a campaign, in his case, one particular operation, Richard Nixon's television campaign. How Nixon was used television to, uh, in, in his campaign. And that was orchestrated by Roger Ailes, the same man who went on to create Fox News. Fair and balanced. Um, <laughs> Ailes pulled quite a trick out of his hat. Uh, quite a rabbit out of his hat, to, speak, to keep with the Easter theme. Uh, he made a seemingly unlikable or distant figure likable, or at least more appealing than he had been. That is Richard Nixon. Although McGinnis was careful not to make grand claims about the effects of Nixon's TV strategy, this is what I found looking at the reviews of the book. Clearly the reviewers' in inference was that the TV strategy had elected Nixon. Uh, remember, he had won narrowly. And many of his detractors could not believe he could have gotten elected except by some magic uh, or alchemy uh, in, in the form of television. Uh, among journalists, those overseeing the crafting of the message were suddenly receiving more attention uh, from reporters and the, than the message itself. And I have found different examples of this, including a long New York Times Magazine piece in 1972 by Victor Navasky, who was really writing about people who craft political ads. And, and consultants and so forth. A more recent example is Dick Morris, the political consultant who worked for both Bill Clinton and Jesse Helms in the 1990s. Time Magazine called Morris the most influential private citizen in America. Yet was the 
new attention to political consultants really justified. As I gathered materials for this talk, and yes, I did gather materials for this talk, um, I realized that PR practitioners, that is, PR councils as we used to call them, ad agents and others, had been involved in the marketing of candidates since the early 20th century. The historian Michael McGurr found evidence of what were then called publicity bureaus, uh, uh, created by both major parties and, and an important part of their arsenal by the 1916 campaign. That's Wilson versus Hughes. Okay, those of you scoring at home. Uh, that year, McGurr concluded, advertising completely overshadowed the oratory and didactic pamphlets of education, run like modern ad agencies, the national party committees shaped public perception of their candidates through press releases and paid advertisements. Today, one prominent Democrat wrote that year, publicity in all its myriad forms is 90% of the whole business. It's 1960s, right? Okay. Both parties partnered with publicists, often former journalists and advertising agents in the 1920s. McGurr points out, and I didn't know this, that when Warren Harding, fellow Buckeye, was running for president in 1920, he met with William Wrigley, the gum chewing manufacturer, to get marketing ideas. Okay, chew on that for a while. Uh, there's a charming article, which I reread this morning, about Calvin Coolidge, Massachusetts governor, soliciting the advice of the ad agent Bruce Barton, whose papers are here, by the way, at the Historical Society, to enhance his image and presidential prospects. Barton was happy to help, even advising Coolidge on using the then newest technology, radio, uh, during the 1924 campaign. Barton, by the way, had very shrewd advice to offer Coolidge, which anticipated Franklin Roosevelt's masterful use of radio, about how, to, how a candidate should use the radio. Okay? Uh, Barton loved Coolidge, wrote one historian, and perhaps what Barton loved most of all was his own creation, his construction of Calvin Coolidge. And the most powerful case of political consultants' involvement in political history came in California in 1934. I don't know how many of you know this story? The socialist Upton Sinclair had an upset win in the Democratic gubernatorial primary on a promise of ending poverty in California. California's political elites and business leaders, including the heads of the movie studios, were horrified. They turned to PR practitioners to attack Sinclair and elect in what was a thoroughly democratic year a thoroughly dim-witted Republican incumbent. Leading the campaign were the advertising agent Al Lasker and Clem Whitaker, who's considered the first full-time political consultant. Billboards, newsreels, showing the unemployed rushing to California if Sinclair won. Okay. The anti-Sinclair campaign, however, I think has been misunderstood. PR practitioners had been already involved in campaigns, and remain routinely involved in them in, in, into our own time. There's, a, there's a, a monograph actually by political scientist Stanley Kelly, a few of you may have had to read when you were here, uh, that documents how thickly involved ad, ad advertising and PR professionals were in the 40s and 50s. Uh, how John Kennedy had a pollster working for him, it was Lou Harris. And I've seen some of the documents at the Kennedy Library. Yet most journalists initially didn't talk about that. They didn't highlight the presence of these uh, consultants. There were exceptions to be sure. But this is where I think, and even Teddy White didn't really give a lot of play to the role of consultants. This is where I think McGinnis's book made a difference. Um, turning reporters toward campaigns as stagecraft, a speech as a TV appearance. And something else, which is a more cynical generation of reporters who grew up in homes with televisions. They were, I suspect, too cynical at times for their own good, and were giving the PR counselors, maybe I shouldn't be saying this and you're going to make me pay for my lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me, because my wife is, is in marketing, okay? She wouldn't come. Okay. Um, but, but I suspect they were too cynical at times for their own good. That is to say, they were giving the PR counselors too much authority. Candidates were not marionettes, even ones who seemed rather thick or to have memorized some zinger during a debate could do great harm if elected. There were other factors. Consultants or some of them began publicizing their own efforts, making their power too visible, 
One of them, Joseph Napolitan, who just died recently, uh, published a book in 1972 bragging about his role in electing a senator in Alaska and nearly winning Humphrey the election against Nixon. Okay? Napolitan's book infuriated political reporters, including David Broder, who said what this book amounts to is a contempt for politics, politicians, and political parties by a man who makes his living from politics. Still another factor, and this is an educated guess on my part, is that political consultants have a higher profile because of television. They, are, they became more frequent guests on television. One of the things I did in my research, I've been looking at Eric Severide's papers. I don't know how many of you remember Eric Severide. But he left his, or his family left his papers, the Library of Congress, and there's a chunk of them from after he retired in the 80s. He remained a consultant to CBS News. And he took that, that consultancy seriously. And there are copies of the letters he was sending to Dan Rather and others at the network about what they were doing and maybe what they should be doing and this sort of thing. And it's fascinating reading. I had never really had a, I'd always admired Severide in his career, but these letters are, are, are good reading because he was actively criticizing. And it's fun to see how Rather is trying to has to respond sometimes. <laughs> it's clear that he's putting Rather in a very awkward place because Rather admires Severide, or at least says he does. But how, you know, it's, it's sort of like my experience when I was director of the school and I'd get these little notes from retired faculty about what I should be doing or about the typo and the awards <coughs> dinner and invitation and I just wanted them all to die. No, but, uh, <laughs> no, I, 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 I am a man, I'm man of peace and man of love. But, but Severide's writing his letters and one of the things that Severide complains about at least twice, because I was going through the file the other night, is decrying the presence of political consultants on television, saying they should not be on the, on the air. Uh, personally, I don't think I would, I'm quoting here, I would ever use any of these political consultants or campaign experts, he wrote, 1986. These Washington woods are full of them. Most have no prestige, save what TV exposure gives them. The emphasis here. In another memo that year, he complained, we are building their dubious businesses for them, giving them an authority they hardly deserve. There is something to their work, but not half so much as they pretend. We would not give precious airtime to people in the corporate consulting business. Uh, and God knows there are thousands of them around here, and we ought not to give these political electoral pretenders the same. Severi was fighting a losing battle. Cable offered still more opportunities for individuals like Dick Morris to appear and boast. That's all I've got. <laughs> we had, and I just, I didn't actually word process. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we used to say type it, but uh, I've, we've got a few minutes. Is that fair, Gary, for questions? So I would agree with you that politicians themselves haven't changed. And I covered politics for 25 years. And their quality at the electoral level, there's always bad apples. There's always kind of, have the voters changed? Yeah. That's, a great, that's a great question. And the medium, media with which they communicate has changed. Has that changed yeah. our voters? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I want to be clear. I don't want to put too much of the burden on journalists because I think we, the audience is, to your right, the audience has changed. Um, I, was, I was telling uh, Joey Terry that, that I have a, I have a, I'm teaching an opinion writing class. John McNelly used to teach in a school, and how few of them are in politics. And these are future journalists. You know, they, they either want to cover the NBA or, or travel. Um, but, or the NBA travel. Um, but the audience has changed, and, and, and I, the audience is much more cynical. And it's not just the American audience. Uh, one of the more uh, depressing findings I, I determined was, it's also happened in Western Europe. There are also measures, metrics, for instance, in England. I think every country but Denmark or something, in terms of different metrics they use to measure public cynicism about public life. That, those, that cynicism metric is up. It's not just us. I used to blame this all on Watergate, say, or Vietnam, and say if that had, those two events had not happened, our civic life would be much richer, people wouldn't be so cynical. The trouble is the same things happened here. So, I used to deliver newspapers as a kid, and almost every house got the local mm -hmm. daily. It was an exception to, to pass a house. Yeah, yeah. And that was kind of an agenda setting function of what we talk about. Either in politics. By the way, in my block, it's the opposite now. We're one of the few houses that gets a newspaper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, 
the social media people select what they want to hear and what they want to read and self-reinforcing, as we all know. Yeah. And, and that's changed the debate too, hasn't it? And so journalists are only yeah. as good as the people they can access in this. Yeah, no, I, um, can you comment on where that's heading? Well, I, I can't, I, actually, I would, I would defer to colleagues of mine who are looking more closely <laughs> at new media uh, and, and, and how, you know, how people are learning. Um, so I, I really I don't want to step in. That's not my area code or not my my comfort zone. I'm I'm still sort of stuck in the 20th century, if not the 19th. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but that's changed journalism. I mean, yeah. In that sense, you know, I am thinking one thing. We we, we were we were very nervous when the web was introduced. That it was going to kill long form journalism, mm -hmm. and that people were going to want just bits. One thing I will notice. I was referencing my sports writers. Uh, how many of them read the Grantland on ESPN, which is long form stuff? And these are these are among my best students, but they they will they will send me the links and I say, Prof Bob, you got to read this. You know, of course, I, of course, then me, I, I, I never do. But, oh, it's too long. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, I was born in the Truman administration. No, I can't handle that. But, no. I was just going to say, just piggyback a little bit on, on your comment that you know, with the advent of social media, and the use of the internet, more people. View themselves as reporters, yeah. you know, and the impact that that has had. Mm -hmm. So, um, I just I think that has no. watching this in the political arena, you know, comment. I don't know how many of you saw the story in the New York Times uh, Monday. It's pretty at the time if you can or if you can pull it up. It's that President Obama did have this large following that people likened to Reagan in 1980, early 80s. Jack Kennedy in the early 1960s. The difference is there's been no second act. There hasn't been a wave of Demo young Democrats going into politics, drawing inspiration from Obama. And I recommend that article because the inference is that these people, well, we elected Obama, now I've, I've, my 20, I've given him my 20 minutes. And now on to other things. It's they, they, and and there's, there is sort of a social media explanation for this. Um, so I don't know if that. But again, I recommend that piece. Um, one of the things that speaks to me um, that you touched on today is this idea that, well, heaven forbid we cover the issues. It's not sexy. I don't want to talk about that. And I certainly don't want to buy ad space on a network that gets into that. That's not sexy. Um, how has the decline of the moderate and the increasing polarization of each party played into coverage, journalism, PR? I think it's played a lot. I think I think particularly within the Republican Party, it's been it's been a problem. Um, and uh, you know that's that's been a big factor. I, as far as the coverage, I think it's been it's created more of a challenge. because again, how much how centrist our politics were 60 years ago. Uh, if you look at a transcript, and they have been published in the Kennedy Nixon debates, they're they're arguing about Komoi and Matsu, the islands off China. They're not major issues. Kennedy won't even fully embrace the civil rights movement, uh, although he's, he's closer to it than Nixon, but it's not, a, you know, it's fairly close. Now you have these deep divides. Um, so, but that's another lunch to answer that question. Uh, maybe it dinner, is. maybe breakfast, uh, Easter brunch. But, you know, I would say this, that, and I'm speaking as someone who, who's, is that I think that what I, I tell my students in opinion writing is, just because this person is a Republican, I'll just say, say doesn't mean there are, couldn't be elements of value in his position. What annoys me sometimes on MSNBC when I watch it is it seems like they're taking their cues. If John McCain attacks Obama on Ukraine, oh, well, McCain must be wrong. And, and we should, like, give Putin Vermont if he wants it. You know, I mean, <laughs> you know. I don't think that journal. I, it may, and here I'm speaking more of opinion journalists than of, of working reporters. Uh, it's, it's, but, but there are. Uh, I think Rand Paul's got some very interesting ideas uh, that he's presenting. I think Paul Ryan is presenting. I'm not embracing yet uh, Ryan's position, but I think the test to a journalist is, look, there, there may be elements here of this person's candidacy that are worth reporting, reporting fairly. And it could be interesting. Somebody, it may have been Krugman, pointed out that McCain actually had a very interesting health care plan in 2008. I never heard about it. You know, I heard Chris Matthews complain that McCain once spoke behind a, a, a green a backdrop that made him look like an elf. 
Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, that sort of thing. But to the question of issues, I, I like to quote something that, paraphrase something that Henry Luce uh, said, the founder of Time and Life magazines. And I wrote a book on Luce, which is one of the several I've written that's out of print. Um, and that is, uh, if that's always a very humbling moment when your publisher writes you the letter. It's never a nice letter either. Just saying, your, your book is going out of print. Would you like to buy 80 copies? Um, <laughs> you have a warehouse. But Luce, Luce said something to the effect to a bureau chief who I met here. There are no dull stories, there are dull writers. You can make this engaging. Now, I'm not sure I could explain the health care law, Affordable Care Act, because that's a, what is it, over a thousand pages. It's a, it's a long document. That's, that's hard to do. And maybe that's part of the problem. And this is where this is where maybe we have too many lawyers in Congress, that, that we, need a, we need simpler solutions. You know, that's okay. But now I'm starting to blow the eight. And well, one of the things that makes it reporting lazy, and I was guilty of it myself, is there's a tendency to, he said, she said, you're either a liberal or you're a conservative. No, no. So George Bush is president, yeah. young Bush. He doubles federal spending. Clinton balances the budget. Yeah. Clinton's the liberal. Yeah. And George Bush was, was really liberal by almost any measure. Tommy Thompson was liberal by almost any measure. Yeah. Yeah. But it doesn't affect how the conversation's portrayed one iota. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it drives me crazy. The, the, the terms don't even apply anymore. Yeah. It was interesting. If you look at the Tea Party movement, and there's been some really good reporting on the Tea Party movement, by the way. Uh, the New Yorker, the New York Times Magazine, it's good, good pieces. But actually, the origin of the Tea Party movement we tracked to Republicans who were unhappy with Bush and his spending. It was not, but it was not widely covered, but there was this undercurrent of unhappiness. And I'm trying to think, uh, the gov he's now governor of Indiana who voted against the, pr the prescription drug extension. Uh, somebody knows who the current governor of Indiana, if you know the current region. Portman. Rob Portman? No, governor of Indiana. Portman is a senator from, from my beloved Ohio. Uh, but you know, that may have been underreported. And part of it was Republican discipline. They wouldn't, you know, you know how disciplined they, they are compared to Democrats. Uh, but uh, uh, I think that there were, quite, were, were Republicans who, were, who saw this coming, that were aware of just what you're saying. Even that's a largely phony debate, because if you push the Tea Party, you ask them what they would cut. Yeah, it's go. the EPA. It's, they, they talk about 2% of spending yeah. while leaving vast majority yeah. of it. I had a neighbor who marched on Madison about single payer, yeah. and he got a transplant under Medicare and you know, probably spent more money. Yeah. Well, I'm a, I'm a proud son of a, of a former banker, and banker and brother of a former banker, but not big banks, just small banks in Ohio. But their opposition to the bailout is just infuriating me. Do they have any idea what would have happened if the American financial system collapsed, which is what we were, as I understand, we were faced with? But again, there's this denial of uh, that, that sometimes you have to do uncomfortable things and, and uh, things you don't want to do. Um, how are we set? Very good. Again, please, if you if you want to talk, I'll be around for a little bit, and I'd love to. I, I'm sure I said something you disagree with. <laughs> and I hope you're full uh, with a great meal and now hungry for more ideas that Professor has shared with us. Next month will be equally as exciting and we will bring and we will launch summer with it. We will have Vern Stewart from the Madison Mallards who will be coming and we'll be talking about some great integrated marketing and energy to boot. So if you want a little bit lessons on those, uh, join us next month in May. So thank you for coming. Thank you.